Hello. Welcome, everyone. Greetings to the Spokane community and the members of the press. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Jack Archer, and I'm the organizer for Spokane Community Against Racism. We are here representing dozens of community organizations and thousands of concerned individual community members, including Disability Rights Washington, the Peace and Justice Action League of Spokane, the Spokane NAACP, I Did the Time, Greater Spokane Progress, the Smart Justice Spokane Coalition, Spokane Alliance, the Asian Pacific Islander Coalition of Spokane, Freedom Project East, Planned Parenthood Advocates of Greater Washington, North Idaho, the Riverkeeper Society, and many others. Together, we are calling for the Attorney General of Washington to hasten the delivery of publishing of modern model policies on police policy that was passed by legislation last session and to formally oversee the implementation of that state law by, pardon me, by the Spokane Police Department and by the Spokane County Sheriff's Department in cooperation with the Criminal Justice Training Commission as appropriate to their roles. First up to speak to the need for this, we have Curtis Robinson. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Curtis Robinson and I serve as the uh, NAACP Alaska Oregon Washington State Area Conference Criminal Justice Chair, Vice President for the Spokane uh, NAACP, uh, uh, Executive Director for I Did the Time, and as a Commissioner on the Criminal Justice Training Commission for Washington State. So I'm gonna read uh, a couple of things here. Get my uh, stuff together. So here is a statement uh, that came out uh, August 5th uh, from the Attorney General's office um, uh, with, uh, posted on Rep Goodman's uh, site. And it says, uh, and I'm not gonna read all of it, but here's some cliff notes. So Deputy Solicitor General Alicia O. Young and Assistant Attorney General Shelley Williams make clear that nothing in the new law prevents officers from responding to community caretaking calls or calls for assistance with a mental health crisis. Police can show up to assist designated crisis responders and other behavioral health calls. It also goes on, and this is in reference directly to the issues that have been stated around 1310. It goes on further to say that uh, many, if uh, not most police departments have confirmed their continued commitment to respond to community caretaking calls and to serve their community, said Goodman. Law enforcement has always had the discretion to decide which calls to show up to. However, not responding at all to a mental health crisis or a call could jeopardize community safety, especially where police can and should employ a host of available de-escalation tactics to resolve situations peacefully. We hope that these agencies that are now pausing will consider this in light of this uh, AGO, uh, uh, AGO guidance. We hope that this robust guidance from the Attorney General's office is clarifying. We have been working with law enforcement agencies and organizations to ensure they have clarity to do their job, said Johnson. Um, I am submitting a set of key questions to the uh, Washington State, from the Washington State uh, Association of uh, Sheriffs and Police Chiefs to the Attorney General's Office for a formal advisory opinion. We look forward to continuing to collaborate closely with our partners in law enforcement to meet community expectations. I have another reference. And this is uh, from Director Monica Alexander uh, with the Criminal Justice Training Commission. And this is a reference to uh, 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 House Bill 1054. Plain meaning and interpretation. The first interpretation I would call a plain meaning interpretation. This means that a court would look to the plain meaning of the terms and assess the legislative intent from there. This interpretation, the courts could apply to a definition of the term firearm. That means a weapon from which a shot is discharged by gunpowder. Consequently, any less lethal munitions, gunpowder to discharge a 50 caliber round or greater, then those munitions would be prohibited. An alternative interpretation. 
especially this interpretation, we'll look at House Bill 1054 and 1310 in tandem and come to the conclusion that less lethal munitions are not prohibited military equipment. While 1054 forbids firearms of 50, uh, 50 caliber or greater, 1310 requires law enforcement to use less lethal alternatives when available to include beanbag rounds, to include beanbag rounds. Because 1310 encourages the use of beanbag rounds and, less, and other less lethal means, it is logical to assume that there was no intent to forbid such munitions by this legislator. Frankly put, the commission understands that there are at least two reasonable interpretations of HB 1054 in, in uh, regards to whether less lethal munitions that exceed 50 calibers, such as bearing rounds, are prohibited under that bill. At this time, the commission has not adopted a policy in regards to this issue. The AGO, uh, before taking any action, or oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, skip, uh, the commission intends to wait for legal clarification, whether that uh, be from legislation, the courts, or the attorney general's office before taking any action required of it, meaning that at this time, the commission does not consider the use of these munitions that fall into this gray area to constitute the use of excessive force or to be wrongdoing. On its own, the otherwise legal use of these less lethal munitions will not result in any action being taken by the commission at this time. And so I reference those to kind of set a context about what, um, you know, what we're really gonna kind of unpack here hopefully a little bit, and I can hang on to my notes here. Uh, that you know we're getting a lot of response and a lot of reactivity from the law enforcement community. The question is not whether that's happening, it's why is it happening. And so hopefully some of this just addressed some of those concerns that some of you might have. Um, some of the other speakers are gonna go into that uh, uh, quite a bit more deeply. But I think for me, um, what we're talking about here today is kind of summed up in some of the things I'm about to say and that this is about an invitation for cultural change with this industry. This is about some natural human tendencies to resist that change. This is about not just law enforcement accountability, it's also about how our human, uh, human beings on the other side of the badge are reacting. It's just never, it, 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 it must never be a, okay for any law enforcement organization to either refuse to show up when community calls or to show up and do almost nothing because they do not appreciate being told how to do their jobs, i.e. having their power curbed. The reality is for, uh, for too much of the law, and for far too much of the law enforcement reactions point straight to the reasons why these reforms and more are needed to transform this into the community service industry it should be instead of a self-centered one. This needs to represent this industry this community, this law enforcement family needs to represent the best of us instead of the best of all of us instead of the worst of some of us. And with that, I'll pass. Thank you, Curtis. Next up, we have David Carlson. Thank you, Jack, and thank you, Curtis. My name is David Carlson. I'm the Advocacy Director at Disability Rights Washington. And I'm the boring lawyer for the day. I, I'm going to run through the law for folks. Um, you're going to hear, um, like Curtis, community members who've been engaged in this issue for a long time and have been leading the way in reform that's long overdue. What you're seeing in the statute that was passed this last session is the work of years of work of community members from here in Spokane and other communities around the state. Now, I'm going to talk about two statutes, two laws that were passed this last year. Mainly, I'm going to talk about one. It's often referred to as 1310. And that law um, provided a, a framework for a new way of thinking about law enforcement. It's new for law enforcement, but I think a lot of um, the average person walking down the street would think that that's what's already supposed to be happening in law enforcement, but we'll see the things they changed might surprise you that they weren't that way to begin with. And then there's another law 
1054 that has gotten a lot of questions from law enforcement about how they're supposed to to change the tactics they use or the weapons they use in um, using force. So let's start with that first one, 1310, the overarching one. And that uh, that law is not all that complicated. I know there's been a lot of talk, ah, oh, it's really, there's ambiguity, it's complicated. As far as statutes go, it's pretty straightforward. There's always going to be some ambiguity, some reasonable people who can read different things into a law. I don't think there's a lot reasonable people can disagree about this law. I think if you're intending to read absurdities into it, you certainly can read absurdities into it, but not reasonably coming up with wildly different interpretations of what's expected here. Now, for those people in the room, you can, uh, there's a resource table near the front door. It has um, a, every bill that is, that goes through the legislature has a report written on it that sort of summarizes in plain language, what is this bill trying to do? I think that's an incredibly useful document. I've highlighted sections I'm going to be talking about, so if you want to refer to any of those, feel free to pick up, there are several copies, uh, pick up a copy of that legislative report over there. Now, it starts that report that, the, that this reform on use of force was intended to protect the constitutional rights of people from excessive force by their government. And I think if we start to dig into this, we'll see they're quite reasonable constraints. So first, law enforcement must use reasonable care. That means they have to try to de-escalate situations. They can only use physical force when they're working on protecting against criminal conduct or they have, uh, that where there's probable cause to make an arrest or they're actually making an arrest or they're trying to prevent an escape um, or they're protecting against bodily injury either to law enforcement, a member of the public or maybe that person's trying to hurt themselves. Law enforcement can step in and use force to help that person not hurt themselves or hurt somebody else. They can only use deadly force if there's an imminent threat of serious physical injury or death. That sounds pretty reasonable. I think if you ask the average person walking down the street, when should police be able to kill somebody? It's only if they're pretty sure that imminently that person might seriously harm someone else or kill someone else. Um, that's not an extreme, uh, an extreme expectation. It also asks that they use the least amount of force necessary in these situations. Again, you ask a reasonable person, how much force should someone, a police officer use? Only as much as they need to. I think we all kind of hope and we put trust that that's what's being done, but apparently we had to write it down and put it in a law, and that law is being complained about now. Now, when considering how much force to use, the statute even tries to be really clear. You should consider things like, is the person you're using force on pregnant? Are they a child? Are they someone with a uh, physical or cognitive disability? Are they someone who's labeled a vulnerable adult? That's often someone who's um, older. Are they someone with li limited English proficiency? I think this, the, the legislature was being very helpful to, to law enforcement in saying, we'll, we'll help you think through this. Here are some examples of things you should consider in what is the right amount of force to be using in a certain situation and that you should use less lethal alternatives and your law enforcement agency should provide those less lethal, op, um, uh, less lethal alternatives to you. You should get training on how to use these less lethal alternatives, how to do um, de-escalation, how not to use lethal force on people who themselves are not all that dangerous, and that local governments and local law enforcement agencies can even raise the bar from here. They said, we're just, we're putting it at a pretty reasonable level we think everyone can agree, but if your local city wants to say, no, you, we're going to restrict it even further, there's still room to do that. Now, with that backdrop, they said, here are some things that are going to be off limits. And so they passed 1054. And that says, no holds, no choke holds. What is that? That's a hold that is intended to stop your breathing. It's not to constrain you, keep you in one spot, to stop your breathing. Or a hold that is intended to stop the blood from going to your head so you pass out. Um, also, you, uh, there, there is a work group that has been convened to examine how canines are used. In our community, 
uh, recently, we've, we've seen some problematic canine use. And the legislature said, yeah, we want the, the um, criminal justice training center and a, a group of um, stakeholders to examine canine use and come back and explain to us what they think should happen further there. The legislature also said tear gas is off limits except for certain situations. So what are those? These are the situations you'd think, well, that would be the only place you use tear gas, right? Where else should we be using it? Riots, there's a barricaded subject in some building, or there's a hostage situation. Um, and you have, to, you have to try everything else you can before you start using tear gas. You have to inform the person, hey, we're gonna use tear gas, so you better give up now. Give them an opportunity to comply. And if the riot that you're gonna use tear gas is in some community setting, not like in a jail or prison, you have to ask the, the highest elected community leader in that area, can we use tear gas on this riot? That's the requirements. It's, um, now, then it goes on to military equipment, and we've heard some talk of this. We've heard talk of the firearm ammunitions of 50 uh, caliber or more. Let's see some of the other things that are lumped in there and see if we can determine whether or not they intended to put bean bags in this category. Machine guns, armed helicopters, armed and armored drones, armed vessels, armed vehicles, armed aircraft, tanks, long range acoustic, ha acoustic hailing devices, rockets, rocket launchers, bayonets, grenades, missiles, and directed energy systems and electromagnetic spectrum weapons. I think we can easily read this law and the one I talked about earlier about using less lethal measures and see there's a difference between the 50 caliber that's referenced here and the bean bags that are actually explicitly referenced as a less lethal option in the other law. And then finally, law enforcement have to make themselves visible in some fashion wearing a uniform or identifying police in their name. And there are limits on ve vehicular pursuit, kind of similar to the, the, um, the use of force. It has to be pretty serious. And then also the prohibition against no-knock warrants. That's where you can be sleeping and they just kick down your door without knocking and announcing themselves. So that's, um, and it, it's, it's not highly used, but it apparently, um, needs to be explained that that can be a dangerous situation. I think we can all imagine how it'd be quite dangerous for someone to not announce that they're law enforcement and then enter someone's home um, with guns drawn. So that's what the laws say. They seem pretty reasonable to me. I understand I'm a lawyer, I'm an advocate, that makes me unreasonable by nature. But I think the general public can hear what they put in there, the legislature, and say, that sounds pretty reasonable. And then ask yourself, like Curtis said, why is the complaint here? And of course there's going to be resistance to having to change the way you operate. But these are not unreasonable changes that are being requested. And they reflect the will of the people. The, the Spokane voters overwhelmingly approved Initiative 940 several years back. This is a continuation of that work to bring our law enforcement practices in, on the books into alignment with what the community expects. And, um, we hope that the Attorney General's office will see the urgency of pushing forward and issuing more guidance to resolve any possible reasonable or unreasonable questions that may be raised so that we can move forward with a more accountable, responsive uh, law enforcement system in our state. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, next up, to offer more personal perspective, we have Jermaine Williams with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me pretty clearly? Good. Uh, so good afternoon, uh, members of the press, supporters who stand here in solidarity behind me, uh, people who are out overlooking as well as people at home or anywhere else for that matter who are privileged to be witnessing this press conference right now. Uh, my name is Jermaine Williams and I am the director of Freedom Project East here in Spokane, a nonprofit organization designed to build relationships and create opportunities 
for those people who are directly impacted by oppression and mass incarceration, systemically and historically, uh, to have an opportunity at a successful transition back into the community. One of the things that I really love about our organization, Freedom Project East, is that not only are we centering the lived experiences of those people who are black, indigenous persons of color who've been directly impacted again by oppression and mass incarceration, but also their families. Because for every individual who is suffering in one form or another, there are people behind them who are also suffering. The same way that we celebrate each other's successes and glories vicariously, we also suffer vicariously as a result of things that people are going through. Normally for people who know me, I'm a smiler. I smile a lot, that's what I do, right? You get to see my teeth a lot. Good thing I'm not a smoker. Uh, today, not so much though. Today, not so much. Not only for the reason that we're here, but because if I'm being as honest as I possibly can, as honest as I possibly can, simply as a human being, I'm a person who's directly impacted by oppression and mass incarceration. I got in trouble as a kid, 17 years old. I made some decisions that cost me a hefty price that included or involved harming other human beings. And as a result, I ended up spending 25 years and three months incarcerated straight. No breaks, no furloughs, no escapes. Had it not been for the research done by Brian Stevenson, and the EJI, the Equal Justice Initiative, they created reforms uh, to understand factually and scientifically that the brain is not developed in men and women, non-binary folks, until we're well into our 20s, well into our 20s. This very moment, I would be in prison. I'd be in prison this very moment instead of here with all you amazing folks. So while I had the opportunity to release early, if you want to call 25 years and three months early, the reality is that my son is now incarcerated. My son is now in prison, right? So when we're talking about generational choices, generational decisions and how that impact people, that's a real thing for me. I'm not saying that for a sob story. I'm not saying that for sympathy, any of that. What I'm saying that for is we're talking about human beings and what we live with and what it takes in order to walk in our shoes day in and day out. Now, I would like to read something to you all. I'm also a member of the Washington State Supreme Court Racial Justice Consortium as well, right? And I came recommend it, fact check it. Anything I say, please fact check it. We all have phones. And I came highly recommend it. I was invited directly by Justice Mary Yu, but I came highly recommend it from Spokane's own Washington State Chief Supreme Court Justice Deborah Stevens. Shout out Deborah Stevens for anybody who knows who Deborah Stevens is. I want to read something to you all. Systemic racism and oppression in policing do not mean that each individual in law enforcement supports racist ideas. It means that the system produces racist outcomes, results that disproportionately hurt other hurt people of color. It is clear in use of force data, traffic stop data, and police killings, people of color are disproportionately harmed by law enforcement. As I stand here today, knowing that the numbers are not necessarily on my side, that we live in a city as beautiful and amazing and phenomenal as the Lilac City is, knowing that we live in a city where people who identify as black are five, like, one in five times, right, to, 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 to get arrested. Uh, the reality is that factor in my history as a human being. Factor in the choices I made. I'm not going to stand here and say I made mistakes. Granted, my brain wasn't fully developed and I wasn't mature, but I'm not going to sit here and say that I made mistakes, right? That implies knowing I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know the harm I was causing, but I knew what I was doing. I didn't make mistakes. I made poor choices is what I made, right? And again, it cost me, and more importantly than that, it cost my family, and it cost other people, and it cost their families and society as a whole quite a bit. Now, you factor in all of that, you factor in looking me up and seeing my record and things of this nature, you put somebody in the law enforcement community inside of a uniform with a badge and a gun and other things that are designed to not only protect people, but to keep certain people who they deem to be or label to be dangerous from hurting and harming other people, I have even more of a chance 
likeliness of being stopped, of being hurt, of being killed, murdered, losing my life. Right? Fortunately, I have not. Fortunately, I have not been killed. I have not been murdered. I have not lost my life. So I stand here today with the opportunity to speak to that, to speak to the beauty of reforms that prevent law enforcement officials from using deadly force, namely chokeholds that would stop me, an asthmatic individual, that would stop me, an individual who has extreme allergies. Check my record. Again, fact check anything I say. You can check Sacred Heart, emergency room, or deaconess. I've been there about seven times in 12 months, literally, no exaggeration. Maybe 10 times in 15 months, right? Asthma and allergies. I have a respiratory issue. I have a respiratory disorder. So put a chokehold on me, any one of you. You don't need to use a nightstick or a billy club. Put a chokehold on me. I probably won't be able to come out of that situation alive, right? So these reforms that have currently and recently come into place that give me, an individual like me, an individual like me who represents the communities that I'm a part of, the communities that I come from, even in so much as this red, black, and green thing you see on my hand was given to me by one of my brothers on the inside. So I don't wear jewelry, but people always see me with this thing around my neck. It's not to be fancy or because it looks cute. It's because I never forget where I came from. I never forget where I'm going, and I try not to forget the individuals who I left behind who are simply waiting on an opportunity to do the same thing, if not more, or greater things than what I am doing, right? But I have a chance. I have a chance to do better. I have a chance to reform myself. I have a chance to move forward. I have a chance to create an opportunity or an example for people to say, you're not that bad. Maybe other people aren't that bad either. We gave you a shot and you did pretty good with that shot. Maybe we should give them a shot as well. But what about those individuals who have lost their lives to police brutality? What about those individuals who've lost their life to lethal force? What about their, those individuals who have lost their life to chokeholds, et cetera, and they don't have the same luxury of standing here hurting today because of all of their intersections, because of all the things that they deal with mentally, emotionally, psychologically, physiologically, medically, or otherwise, right? Because they don't have the luxury of standing here today and blabbering about how not only did they lose their life to the system for 25 years and three months, but now they've just lost their son to the same system designed to create and perpetuate, that's working perfectly, by the way, targeting those people who are black, indigenous, persons of color, poor people, people who've been historically, systemically disenfranchised, marginalized, and the list goes on. What about those people? So I stand here today not to browbeat the police. That's not what I'm here for. I don't stand here today looking for a sob story or for people to be sad or say, hey, man, you're an amazing speaker. I really appreciate what you said. That really touched me. I don't stand here for that. What I stand here today for is to say in solidarity with every person in the room and every person watching, I appreciate everyone who has voted for the reforms that we currently get to benefit from. I appreciate everyone who leveraged their vote as a voice because what we know is that when you don't vote, you don't have a voice. When you don't vote, you don't have a voice. And while it starts at the top, it rolls downhill. Simply put, simply put. So even though I lost my son to the system and for a long time I lost my life, I had a chance to restart my life over and do better and do well and be partnered with some phenomenal organizations and have some amazing people who simply showed me empathy, cared about me, and gave me an opportunity to come into this community and do better. Hence me standing here today. I didn't get here on my own accord. There are a lot of people who I owe my life to that are in this room right here, right now. But more so than that, there are also people, and specifically a person in this room, who lost their child to police violence. That's who I stand here for today. Thank you. Jack, please. Thank you so much, Jermaine. Uh, with that testimony that Jermaine referenced, we have Debbie Novak here to tell her story. Thank you. Thank you, Jermaine. I wanted to come and speak today in regards to the misinformation that has been released to the public in response to the new Senate and House bills 
that have now been enacted into law in the state of Washington. I also speak to you as a mother of a son that was shot and killed by a Spokane City Police Officer on January 7, 2019. You would think that after all this time I could talk about it without getting emotional. My son, David Novak, was shot in the back as he entered his front door to his home. He was unarmed and he had committed no crime. This all happened within 11 seconds of the officer arriving on scene. I also speak to you as a previous Spokane City Police Dispatcher, where for the first year of my training, I was required to go out on patrol. And that's why I get so frustrated when people tell me I don't have a right to say. I have a right to say. I have been out on those patrols and I have seen and witnessed the issues within our police departments. There needs to be accountability by our police officers. This is real. These type of incidences are really happening. When I say both sides, I am talking about the officer that now has to live with knowing that they may have mistakenly taken a life and the grieving family that has had their loved one violently taken from them. And as all you already know, this is happening at record-breaking numbers in Spokane. Spokane is third in the country for police deaths for our population, um, per capita for our population. This is a reputable organization mapping police violence that reports these figures. And this is information that they get from the FBI and the Department of Justice. I want to applaud our senators and representatives and our Spokane City Council for their tireless work to attempt to restore the public's trust and faith in our law enforcement. As of December 2018, and I bring up December because that's when Initiative 940 was, went into effect, until February of this year, there has been 105 people in Washington State that have lost their lives due to police um, use of lethal force. Lethal force. That's just in the state of Washington, 105. I am sure that you and others, and that includes myself, are outraged and consider this unacceptable. These new laws are a step in the right direction in saving lives and helping our law enforcement agencies to gain credibility from the citizens of Washington State. These laws will serve as a vehicle to ensure that local agencies are doing their job of a proper investigation without outside influences. And when I say outside influences, I'm going to bring up the elephant in the room, the police guild. It goes without saying how ludicrous it is to have a police officer's union have a say in whether an officer is held accountable for his actions and whether it can even be investigated. No other profession does this. These police officers or law enforcement agencies, they need oversight that is not hindered by a union contract as it has been in the past. Several of these new House bills and Senate bills that now are law address this issue. This will make for a better work environment for the police officers that wants to do a good job and they want to do it right and they want to do it legally. It is quite a process to follow a House bill or a Senate bill from its beginnings until it is actually made into law. It is a complicated process and a detailed process that is carried out by elected officials in our legislature in Olympia. It involves many agencies and rounds of voting and testimonies from both sides. I tried to do testimony in regards to some of these House bills and Senate bills in Olympia. There were so many families and so many mothers and loved ones that I, I couldn't even get a turn. I couldn't get on the list. These laws have been carefully worded and debated by our mayors, police chiefs, and citizens of Washington State. And let's remember what brought this all on. This is what happened last year. The people are demanding change. I've heard several of you already speak about 1310, House Bill 1310 that's now been enacted into law, sets the expectation that de-escalation be an officer's first instinct and that deadly force should only be a last resort. Isn't it just a crying shame that this has to be a law?
but apparently it does. It has to be a law that you only take a life as a last resort. These laws are really common sense laws that the average person cannot grasp that they were not laws that were in place to begin with. So as for the comments that law enforcement won't be able to do their jobs, change is hard, but all professions have change, and this is change that is way overdue, and that will save lives on both sides of the issue. Embrace it and let's stop with the sky is falling mentality. The sky is not falling. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. Next up, we have a statement from a community member who wanted to share their story today but wished to remain anonymous for reasons that will become apparent. Reading that statement for us today is Liz Moore. I'm Liz Moore, director of the Peace and Justice Action League of Spokane. I will now read a statement from a community member and survivor of domestic violence who wishes to share the personal impact of the law enforcement statements around these laws. We are sharing their comments without edit. And I want to give a content warning that this statement includes a description of abuse, violence, and the use of firearms. Here is the statement. I am a domestic violence survivor and have asked others to read my statement to protect my safety. It is extremely difficult to relive the emotional trauma of my experience, but due to recent statements from Chief Meidel and the Spokane Police Department related to the new laws and domestic violence, I feel compelled to do so. I was raised to believe that police were there to protect us, a type of hero. This was reinforced in media, television, and movies throughout my childhood. Fast forward to my early adulthood, married with children, struggling every day to survive the violent hell I found myself in. One of my most traumatic experiences during that time is also the first time I was betrayed by law enforcement and society's promise that they would protect me. During a typical violent episode, my husband escalated and I found myself with the barrel of a gun in my mouth. I can still taste the metal in my mouth as I write this. My kids screaming from the other room is what saved my life and allowed me the time to pick up the phone and call 911. When the deputy arrived, I was hysterical, as any person who had come that close to death would be. My husband was calm and collected. The deputy believed my abuser's version, that I was mentally ill and had threatened to kill him and myself, and stated that if they came out again, I would be going to jail. In that moment, I lost all hope of anyone ever helping me out of that situation. I was sure I would die at my husband's hands. Needless to say, I never called 911 again. Reading recent news reports and the Spokane Police Department official social media posts filled with fear-based false rhetoric regarding the new police reform laws and how law enforcement would be unable to respond to most domestic violence calls brought back the worst night of my life. Once again, I was being violated by those I had been told would protect me. The, bear, the behavior of the duty that responded the night I called, excuse me, the behavior of the deputy that responded the night I called 911, and these types of statements of false rhetoric from the police department are a part of the same system of violence that feeds domestic violence with tactics to maintain power and control over others. Shame on Chief Meidel and the Spokane Police Department for using domestic violence as a tool to get community sympathy for their outrage at having to make reforms. Shame on them for sending the message to abusers that they can get away with the abuse because law enforcement can't do anything. Shame on them for sending the message to victims who are struggling to survive and find their way out that law enforcement won't help them. Shame on them for playing the victim while using the abuser's tools to maintain their power and control over the very people they swore to serve and protect. Thank you.
Thank you, Liz, and thank you to the community member who uh, bravely shared their story with us. Our city council president, Brian Beggs, uh, asked to share some words on this, and so I'm going to welcome him to the podium. First, I really want to thank everybody for being here. This isn't a typical press conference. There's no talking points. It's taking way longer because it's such an important issue. And I want to thank our media partners for covering it. I think it'll be more than a one minute story tonight. I hope you'll have enough content to do other things and really dive into this because this is one of the issues of our time. Before I go forward, I just want to acknowledge the lived experience and the stories that we heard today. And I just want to thank people for being that honest with their lives uh, in front of the cameras and the lights. So thank you for that. I came here today because um, the groups that were sponsoring this said, what's, what's your response, city? It's been a year. Come, come tell us your response to our messages. So, I want to be clear that I support all the work and the advocacy that's going on, but I'm really here as the only citywide elected official who, in our city to try to tell you about what's going on and some perspective of what we're trying to do as a city. From my perspective, I'm not speaking for the entire council, so we haven't had a vote on what I'm going to say. Uh, but I think I know what their hearts are and what we're up to. So that's why I'm here today. Uh, is to just give a response since this is all going on. You can get it all. You can get their lived experience and their requests and demands, and you can hear a city elected official's response. But before I do that, I ask permission to, for just for a moment of personal privilege, about 11 days ago, I announced publicly that I was undergoing some cancer treatment. So I'm living that treatment in public. So. Uh, to let people know and maybe save some time afterwards of telling 30 people what's going on. Um, I'm doing really well. I'm one day away from finishing my third week of treatment of chemo and radiation. And as you can see, I'm doing pretty darn well. Um, I've got four weeks to go. Uh, my family and I appreciate all the well wishes that we've gotten. So I just want to acknowledge we've gotten plenty and whether it's a text or an email, and don't feel like you need to send the card, but I've gotten some from my closer friends. We're just feeling very supported. So just want to thank you and acknowledge that moment as well. But I tell you, if anything that could get me off my medical leave, it would be police reform. So I'm, I'm here for that. And I think it's fair for anyone that doesn't know me well or any viewers that they understand where I'm coming from, what my experience is, so that you understand. Because we always need to know, well, what, what are the prejudices and agendas for people? And so I've been a lawyer for uh, just about 30 years. And I want you to know that most of my clients over those 30 years are victims of crime and other illegalities. That's who I represent, crime victims. And along the way, I've represented several law enforcement people, both as victims of crimes and also as uh, in, they're in departments and they're being abused by their superiors. So I've represented law enforcement. In my current, you know, I've, I was best known for suing the city for some police misconduct over the years. Uh, but I've, since 2016, I've been on the city council and I represent all groups in the city now, whether it's neighborhoods, whether it's crime victim uh, advocacy organizations, whether it's police reform advocacy organizations. I represent our police department to try to make sure that they have the training and the resources that they need to do their job and can stay safe. So I, for the last five and a half years, my job has been to represent all those. And I do my best to meet with them. I've met with the police guild, the lieutenants and captains. I meet with police leadership. I've participated in videos that help law tell the good things that they've done. I've met with SCAR numerous times and other groups. I've met with, the, like I said, the crime victim advocates. So that is how I view my role. 
And so I don't view myself as a single advocate anymore, which is what I did when I was doing these issues as a lawyer. So in a little bit indifferent than that, I have done so many cases on police practices in the Fourth Amendment and when police can stop and not stop. And I've argued before courts uh, up and down, state courts, federal courts, appellate courts. And I feel like I know those even though I'm not a police officer and would never be uh, one. I know those issues from a legal perspective. I've also done lots of constitutional law around the Fourth Amendment. I've taught constitutional law. And I've always been active in the legislature and lobbying. And in the last four years, I've worked for Association of Washington Cities in their legislative lobbying and process. And you'll hear in a moment how involved they are with that. And the Association of Washington Cities is a complete middle of the road organization uh, by everybody's judgment. Um, so I just wanted to do that background. So to just take a step back, a little over a year ago, in May, George Floyd was killed. Our city rose up and said, we got to do something. City Council, what are you going to do? And we have spent that year with stops and starts trying to address these issues as best we can for the entire city, for all people in the city, regardless of your position. And the first thing that we did uh, was we I published a, a list of maybe 25 potential police reforms. And that's on our website right now. You can see it, what they were at the time. I think we published those in June. And not long after that, the city administrator and the mayor came to me and said, can we do something more collaborative? Do something a little different that's going on in other places. And we did, we agreed, we said, all right, let's, let's figure out how to have a community conversation about these, rather than the city council jamming through some laws and then the administration refusing to do it and then having to go to court and who knows how that would turns out because the idea and i'm happy to have other people who disagree with me because there's other people who said this has been too long just pass the law go to court and there's a piece of me that says when we change the hearts and minds of people on the other side if we can get there together we will really be there and we will not have to be in risk. So that is my personal belief. And when I got the other side to say, yes, they would do that, that's, that's the way I went. We negotiated several things that we think we can just start implementing. But there were some other tougher ones that were the subject of these bills. So we started that process in negotiating. COVID got worse. We couldn't figure out how to do it safely with in-person and it got delayed, all sorts of things happened. It got delayed way too long. But the idea evolved into what we would do is we would have a group of about 20 people as a precursor to a full community conversation. And the 20 people were designed to be representative of different groups. We have multiple police officers and leaders. We have multiple people from communities of color and community uh, police reform. We have crime victims, we have a retired judge, we have someone from the neighborhoods, um, and various people. The idea was to have a conversation and find out where the common ground and where the hard points and the pitch points, and what worked in terms of resolution, in terms of people just, instead of people talking past each other, which is often the case, and kind of going on right now, if you compare the police chief conference with this conference, you'll be like, yeah, you're talking past each other. So the idea was is just to do a bit of a pilot on that community conversation. And then out of that conversation and what we learned, design a publicly facing community conversation where anyone could attend. Because these current ones are private. And that, that, that was our strategy. Again, not everybody loved that strategy, but that's what we did. But in the meantime, per today, we got very involved at the legislature. I told you I sit on the legislative committee for AWC. I and some other people last summer, we took this issue, which was not on the AWC agenda, and we got it front and center. And our leadership at the top, which included um, Council Member Candace Mum, supported making this one of the top issues of AWC in the legislature. At the same time, there were some amazing legislators of color, mostly younger, going forward, and the senior committee chairs said, we will support you, but stand a little bit behind you. And we passed 
this year, I don't know how many reforms, if you want to count the subheadings, but 30 or 40 police reform changes. The most in the nation, we are now the most modern uh, police laws in the nation, in my opinion. And that really came, oh, there are a lot of people working on it and pushing on it, but I believe that if the Association of Washington Cities and the City of Spokane's participation in that was not there, I don't think they all would have passed. They might have, they might have, but I don't think they would have. And so I put my energies into AWC and lobbying. I testified well over a dozen times uh, from Spokane to tell them our experience and what our solutions were. I was on the small team that negotiated. We negotiated these reforms. All of them except, well, we negotiated all of them, but I would say all but 1310 AWC supported. And AWC's team included police chiefs, mayors, and we got the, a big police union from the state involved. So this was a collaborative process. This was not we got the votes, we're gonna get this. This was a collaborative process. And David talked about 1054. The original 1054 looked very different than the one that passed. And it's full of compromises. And I was involved in those compromises. The first one banned all canine units. And instead we came up with a study to focus on this issue. Not that we, canine units can be very useful when they're on a leash and on a lead. It's when they're indiscriminately biting people that's the problem because you can't really control them. They cause a lot of damage, they cause a lot of fear, and it's rarely, rarely necessary. In the last year in Spokane with city council oversight, the number of bites per use of a canine have drastically plummeted. It's about one per month now. It's, it's a huge change. So the study is going to be figuring out how do we do that statewide um, on uh, vehicle chases. I proposed a system that would allow officers more leeway to chase uh, a suspected impaired driver under DUI than the original one, and that's what passed. Um, on tear gas, there was compromises on it. Again, there was none, and then it's, now it's very targeted. And so we had those negotiations with police and we got them through. So I just use those as examples throughout all the police reform legislation. All those compromises and collaboration was going and AWC with their police chiefs and mayors were a part of it and Spokane City Council was part of it. So our city was having an impact on that, which I was very happy about. I wanted to take just a moment because I think 1310 is, is the controversial, is the controversial bill. That's the bill that AWC didn't pass. And as some people said, um, well, before I say that, um, if you want to know really all the reforms, uh, go to the Spokane City Council Vimeo page. So go to vimeo.com uh, and then uh, search for Spokane City Council. A couple study sessions ago, Chief Meidel went through everything with a PowerPoint. Really helpful. It's got it. And when I'm listening there, I'm like, yeah, that's good, that's good, that's good. And I think most of you, I don't care if you consider yourself a police reform advocate or a police supporter, it all makes sense. And in fact, when Chief Meidel was presenting, he was making it make sense and he was, seemed to be supportive of it. I've talked with one of our chief training officers. He's support of the vast number of these things. So it's really not an all or nothing thing. And so I encourage people to just find out what it is. It's, it's remarkable in one legislative session that all that happened. But 1310, and some of, the, some of them are independent investigations when police shoot people instead of local agencies investigating. Some of it is statewide record keeping on police officers, so police officers who get in trouble can't jump to a new, a new city without the other one knowing. And an actual certification and decertification program. So police officers, like any other profession, are licensed and enforced when they're not. But there's so many others. But 1310, well, I'm sorry, out of my order just for a moment. But I do, want to, I do want to say this about the police and a little bit of what that motivation might have been on those press conferences. It's a lot that changed. It's a lot. If your organization changed that many rules in any one uh, in a three-month period, three months from when it passed to when it went into effect, it would be a lot. 
So there's a little bit of that going on, and you'll hear that, and I think that's a fair point. As I said earlier, it's long overdue. It's about saving people's lives, so it is urgent, and we need to do it. But we as a city, from my perspective, need to provide full support to getting all that training done and giving a little bit of grace while people adjust the training they've had for years that is now going to be different. And so there is a piece of that. And as long as the police department tells me we're full bore going and doing the training and we accept these reforms, um, I'm willing to give them the grace and certainly give them the resources so they can't say they don't have the resources. And what that means is it takes money. When you train people, you have to take them off their, you have to take them and pay them overtime to get trained on something like this. So it takes some money to do it, totally worth it. But anyway, I wanted to get back to the, the, the big hot spot, which is 1310, and you already heard about it, uh, reasonable care and that part of it. David covered that great, and like so many people said, I thought that was the law. And what I call it is the law that you want the police to follow when they're pulling over your child. That's, that's what it is. It's like, yep, de-escalate, be reasonable, don't do it. You know, because we want everyone to go home alive, including the police officer. But there are two other points that the police really have raised. And one was that they read it somehow that they could no longer help in mental health crises or community caretaking. He said, oh, we can't do that anymore. That's a really important thing. But the Attorney General today, um, or not today, this week issued an informal opinion to the legislature. This is someone else's copy, but it's here. If you can't get a copy of it, um, you can email me, and I'm happy to email you. I've got a PDF of it. Basically said, no, there's nothing in 1310 that gets in the way of police assisting in a mental health crisis or community caretaking. So that is off the table. They, they raised the issue. It was confusing to them, perhaps, uh, but that is no longer confusing. But the big issue that they raised, and I wanted to spend just a couple minutes on this. It's a little bit law school wonky, but um, in, the, in the law, uh, if you heard the number one concern at the police conferences, is they say they're no longer able to uh, handcuff somebody who's only under reasonable suspicion. And they think that is going to be a big problem, and they've told us that they can't protect us as well. I 100% disagree with that. Um, but I just want to talk about that. And that, I just want to go back. The Fourth Amendment to our Constitution was passed in 1890, excuse me, 1791. And it says you have to have probable cause to put handcuffs on someone, is what the Supreme Court has interpreted that. And usually you have to get a warrant. And you can't search a person. You can't, essentially, usually you can't search. They didn't have cars back then, but you can't search their car. You, they can't bust into your house. They can't look at your email. They need a warrant based on probable cause. Um, that, that, has been the rule, that was the rule from 1791 till June 10th of 1968. So for hundreds of years, the police were able to protect us. Almost 200 years, I should say. And there was a reason they wrote that rule, because they had lived in a police state with King George, where King George's law enforcement could just stop whoever they want, do whatever they want, go into your house. They could even put soldiers in your house. And the people who founded our country said, that's not who we are. We're citizens. We have basic rights. Law enforcement is limited. And they understood that it would be more difficult for law enforcement to enforce the laws doing that. They understood that. But that's always the tension between a democracy and a police state. If you go to Russia and China, they don't have those limitations. And they can investigate quite promptly. Uh, but the problem is when you give law enforcement a wide scope of ability to handcuff whoever they want, lots of people who get handcuffed who have done nothing wrong. They just happen to be near the scene of what happened. And so the balance that the founders created was, um, yeah, you got to have probable cause. Probable cause just means a reasonable person would believe that person had committed a crime. It's not more likely than not. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not hard to get. It may take a little bit of time. 
it's not even that much more than reasonable suspicion. And so, again, June 10th, 1968, our Supreme Court issued a ruling called Terry versus Ohio. And let's remember, well, most of you don't remember June 10th of 1968. I was young, but I do remember it because four days earlier, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. And the rest of that summer was the most violent summer, as far as I know, in our country's history after the Civil War. Things were tough, things were scary. So it's not surprising to me that the Supreme Court wrote, rewrote the Fourth Amendment in the summer of 1968, but that's what they did. They said you don't need probable cause. You can use handcuffs on someone for a while to investigate if you have a reasonable suspicion, and you can articulate a couple facts. One case I read in Washington, the state, the facts were uh, the person was in a high crime neighborhood with a hoodie. And yeah, so it doesn't take much uh, to do that. And yes, it makes it easier for police to handcuff and hold more people. Make no mistake, so that was totally against. So all those people who are for original intent, plain reading of the language, this was a huge departure. Departure. This was judicial legislation which many people decry. What our legislature did when they passed 1310 is they restored the original meaning and interpretation of the Fourth Amendment in the state of Washington. And I, for one, think that is a great idea. It's consistent with our history. So I'm, I'm a supporter. I know it's going to be hard for the police, because all the police officers we have on duty, they've spent their entire career being able to handcuff people under just reasonable suspicion, even though that's not really authorized in the plain language of our Constitution. So it's challenging. It's going to be tough. I get why they're concerned about it. But again, for 180 years, uh, we were, our police were able to protect us, and they'll be able to protect us again. So I want to close with, because I've gone on too long. David thought he was going to go on too long, but I am also a lawyer. So with just this thought, since I represented AutoZem starting in 2006, my effort has been how do we heal the relationship between the community and the police? It has been broken. It has improved quite a bit. Our police since 2012, it took them to 2012 to start, they have undergone numerous reforms. They have made many changes. And yet today in 2021, for people behind me and other people, it's not nearly enough. And they're not wrong. The police aren't wrong that they haven't made, that they've made the changes. The work for city council and my work that I take on and I will spend 100% of my effort on is how do we repair that relationship with the understanding that community members and voters set the policy in this city of how we want to police ourselves and what kind of safety we want through our elected representatives and sometimes at the ballot box of initiatives. We are in charge, the police's job is not to set policy, it's to implement it and be as professional as they can. And I believe that almost all of them are. If I think there's a problem in our community, it is not individual officers, it is policies and training. And I've said that for years and years, and the judge on the Carl Thompson case, who was the officer in AutoZem, that's what he said as well. So it is entirely appropriate for our community members to talk to our legislators and our legislators to pass laws that reflect uh, what the community wants for new policies and new procedures, which will result in new training, which will re result in fewer deaths and fewer injuries, both to community members and law enforcement officers. De-escalation reduces injuries and deaths. It slows it down. So it's entirely appropriate. I also hope, I'm not, I can't mandate anything, but I hope people will continue to give space for law enforcement to grow into these new policies and to realize that once they take off their uniform, they are people just like us. And I support them, I support everybody here. And my last two things I wanna say is, this last year and the results prove that when Spokane leads, Washington follows. But most importantly, 
I ask, my ask to you, I know there's an ask coming to you soon. My ask to you is this, that we adopt as the chief value in the city of Spokane and then make it real for all people. That in the city of Spokane, we all belong. We all belong. And when we get there, we won't be having press conferences like this. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks, Council President. Uh, as we reach the end of this, we are joined by our local representative, uh, State Representative Marcus Richelli, who's going to deliver our ask uh, that we brought you here today to hear again. Well, it's been uh, a very um, impactful uh, time to be here and listen to the stories, listen to everybody share. Um, I'm State Representative Marcus Riccelli. I represent the third legislative district in Spokane, which we are standing in right now. Um, I, before I give a few uh, remarks, I do want to recognize um, first uh, my seatmate, Representative Tim Ormsby, who is here. And when we, t thank you. In addition to supporting this legislation, along with myself and along with Senator Billig. Um, when we talk about the dollars that are needed to implement uh, some of the reforms and the training, as Chair of Appropriation, he makes sure that we have path forward to have that funding. I want to thank uh, Senator Billig's staff for being here, both Noel and Morgan. Um, I want to particularly thank Senator Billig for setting the record straight with Sheriff Knezovich when he said that law enforcement was not consulted. Um, I know that was not correct. Um, I appreciate him setting the record. I know that I spoke with Chief Meidel. I know that Representative Ormsby did. I know that thousands of people communicated through an open and transparent legislative process. And so um, I'm appreciative that the facts are coming out today about the impacts and the implementation and the legislative intent. So why am I here? Um, I wasn't planning on speaking today. In fact, um, I was coming here just to listen along with a number of other folks. But the community invited me to deliver their asks on their behalf. And as their state representative, that's what I intend to do here. The community is calling on the Spokane Police Department and the Spokane County Sheriff's Office to fully implement the police reform measures passed in the legislature last session. We further request the Attorney General's Office and the Criminal Justice Training Center oversee the implementation process in Spokane as appropriate to their roles. Finally, we are joining calls from both law enforcement and other communities across Washington to ask the Attorney General's Office to move swiftly to publish the model guidance for these laws due next year and in the meantime, to provide infor informal opinions to address the most frequently asked questions being raised. Okay, that is the call to action, that is the ask, I'm happy to deliver that. I also wanna mention and reiterate, when behavioral health entities came to me the weekend before implementation and they were scared because they didn't wanna send their workers out, um, those mental health professionals, because they thought law enforcement wasn't gonna stick around, that we now have, thanks to the Attorney General Office, clear legislative intent in that scenario. Um, I want to particularly thank, you heard about some of the leadership in the legislature. Imagine being one of only two black men in our legislature and taking the weight of passing these bills on. My incredible, my incredible respect for the courage and the leadership of Representative Jesse Johnson, and I ask this community to give him a round of applause. And when people push back and say that this was not a statewide effort or input was not given, when Scar asked me to speak on the potential reforms in the legislation, I, I said, well, that would be okay, but let me see if Representative Johnson will come. And he spent an hour on Zoom with Scar to discuss and get feedback. So um, that's what I came here today to share. I appreciate being invited. Um, I appreciate the coverage um, so that we can get the disinformation put to bed. We can get the legislative intent enacted, and we can continue to move forward as a community for the best so that all people can thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Bocelli, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I want to acknowledge again our rep state representatives, uh, Bocelli and Ormsby, who came. Uh, thank Council President Beggs for being here, and also Council Member Betsy Wilkerson, who made an effort to be here as well. And a final thank you to everyone who shared their stories, um, who opened up their hearts uh, 
to speak to everyone. And to everyone who's standing back here in support, we appreciate everyone here and everyone who's watching on television or online. Um, to the press, everyone who spoke, as well as our representatives and elected officials um, here have acknowledged that they'll be available for comment. And um, thank you for being here today.